It's another episode of the React Native Radio Podcast. Here's a challenge. Every time Jamin says Infinite Red, take a drink. Episode 190, Tips and Tricks for the App Store and the Play Store. Hey everyone, welcome to the React Native Radio Podcast, where we explore React Native together. I'm your host, Jamin Holmgren. I'm joined by my two magnificent co-hosts, Robin and Aditi. Harris is not here today, although he is still magnificent. <laughs> how are you doing today, Robin? I'm doing great, Jamin. Awesome. And Aditi, how are you doing? I'm doing well, just watching snow. You have snow? Oh man, I'm jealous now. Mm-hmm. It's been snowing here since morning, and apparently there's going to be a blizzard and a snowstorm. Okay, maybe not so jealous anymore. <laughs> All kinds of things happening. <laughs> yeah. I'll stick with our rain. <laughs> yeah. Robin and I most likely have the same weather since we're in the same... We're both in the Willamette Valley, and it is it's currently raining. Yeah, it's probably 45 degrees. I think <laughs> Portland is only topped in number of days of rain by Seattle, I think. You know, Seattle's just got to be better at everything, right? They got to be a little bigger. They got to have more rain, <laughs> more depressed people. Like, I mean. More water, ferry boats. We, we have a river, though. We have a cool river. We do. They have a They have a whole sound, though. Yeah. It reminds me of an episode in Portlandia where they're like, Wait for like that one sunny day and they're just like waiting to go out and then it starts raining. That hits a little too close to home. I haven't watched that show. Oh, you haven't? For that reason. No. I feel like everybody outside of Portland has watched the show, but <laughs> not as many in Portland. It's a little too close to home. It's pretty funny. Let's get started with our with our episode, uh, which is, by the way, sponsored by Infinite Red. We are a premier React Native design and development agency located fu- fully remote in the USA. We have years of React Native experience and deep roots in the React Native community. We host Chain React, which unfortunately is uh, have, was was canceled last year. And a little sneak peek for people who are who are tuning in to our podcast: it's probably going to be canceled this year as well uh, for reasons which we will not talk about in this particular episode. Uh, we also publish the React Native newsletter to over 12,000 subscribers, actually. And we are the best choice for your next React Native app. So hit us up, hello at infinite.red or infinite.red slash React Native. And I have a little addition to my spiel, if that's okay. I'm I'm trying to keep it a little shorter <laughs> for that reason. Uh, for the very first time, actually, I guess uh, one of the big things with Infinite Red is when we started it, uh, we weren't really interested in making this huge consultancy, like, you know, with tons and tons of like 150, 200 people. And we're about 25 people right now, but we are in a position where we do want to grow a little bit. So what does that mean for our audience here? Why am I talking about this? This isn't Jamin's business podcast. This is React Native Radio. That's because we are going to be hiring React Native engineers, specifically senior level React Native engineers. So... If you are a senior level React Native engineer located in the U.S. or Canada, that's all that we're set up to handle right now. We are fully remote. You can live anywhere in the U.S. or, or Canada, and we we are really well set up for that. Uh, but if you are in the U.S. or Canada, just go to careers.infinite.red and fill out the form there. And, uh, you know, come, come work with us. There's some fantastic engineers. Uh, I might even say magnificent <laughs> engineers, <laughs> including Robin, who is with me on this podcast. I think it's a great opportunity for people in the audience uh, to get a chance to potentially work with us. We we know there's a lot of talent out there in the React Native world. So come uh, come check us out and uh, fill out the form. And Jamin Jamin is biased, so I'll make sure to say that it's a a fantastic place to work. (laughs) Thanks, Robin. (laughs) And Aditi can... uh, attest that uh, I did not hold a gun to her head when uh, mm-hmm. when Robin said that. So No, we're fully remote, so that didn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> and if Harris was here, he could have vouched for you guys more too. That's true. Harris has worked with us in the past and uh, and we love Harris at Infinite Red. Hopefully he likes us too. So anyway, exciting news. Uh, if you have any questions about that as well, you can hit me up on Twitter at Jamin Holmgren. All right, let's get into our topic for today. Today we are talking about 
tips and tricks for the App Store and the Play Store. This is kind of an interesting topic because it's something that isn't, it doesn't impact your day to day necessarily. It's not something that every day you're going to be working on. In fact, I usually look at it as like you have just the right amount of time as a consultancy. You have just the right amount of time between projects to forget everything you knew about launching an app <laughs> when you started or when you finished your, your last project. So it's something that I feel like we continually relearn over and over and over. But it's, uh, you know, it's a very necessary one because if you don't release your app, then nobody nobody gets to see it. It's very true. It, it's one of those things that you kind of just buckle down and figure out. It's not the most fun part of React Native development, but it's definitely necessary. And it's it's kind of one of those things that sort of unites us with the native developers of the world. I mean, every iOS developer, whether they're React Native or Objective-C or Swift, has probably gone through the App Store. And same with the Google Play Store. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Not the most fun thing to do, but we have to do it. I've released apps when we did Native. And I remember the process being painful. And I remember going through the review process and trying to get it by Apple. So is this the part of the podcast where Jamin talks about the good old days? <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> where it was uphill both ways oh boy back in the 90s what happened with apps <laughs> back in the 1990s what we would do is uh we would take our three and a half inch floppy disks we'd insert <laughs> them into our computers and uh, shut the little lever <laughs> no i i never distributed anything back then it was all for my own benefit <laughs> and I, that is not true actually that is not true i did load Cubasic games when I was a teenager onto a three and a half inch floppy, I kid you not, and take it to my cousin's house over on an island. He lived on an island in the middle of the Columbia River. Then plug it into his computer, which was slightly faster than mine. Wait, did he really live on an island in the yeah, middle of the river? Yeah, still does, actually. Yeah. It's, uh, it's an island in... If you're familiar with the Pacific Northwest, it's between Longview and Astoria, basically the stretch of red river kind of you know how oregon kind of has that little bump on the top left you know it's like that top stretch of the bump like it's in the middle of that area right there so you literally wow. carried a floppy disk across a river to an island yes <laughs> i did on a boat not even kidding you. <laughs> like a little it's robot? A, it was a ferry. It was a ferry. Okay. Like a t but when I'm saying ferry, you're thinking like, you know, Puget Sound ferry. You're thinking like these, you know, going to Vancouver Island ferries. No, no. This is the the, the little island. I don't know. I, I better preserve his uh, his pr privacy a little bit. But the little island, it's 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 like a few miles across. It's not like tiny. Um, And there are, I don't know, maybe a thousand people that live on it, something like that. Maybe not even that. A few hundred. It was mostly at the time like dairy farms and stuff like that. But his dad and mom live right on the beach. And uh, he actually bought a, a piece and is living there now with his wife, my my cousin. But but I would bring that, that, that across, you know, <laughs> on, the, on the ferry and we would plug it in and then load up QBasic on his machine and run my games on there. So when all of my QBasic games were lost, I actually asked him, like, do you still have that old computer? And he said, yes, I actually do. So just about... Two weeks ago, he delivered that computer to me and I was so excited. I was like, maybe I can actually get some of my old games back, you know, because it would actually have the source code, too, because that's how I distributed it. it was, I just copied the file. And unfortunately, the, the hard drive was missing out of the computer. So I have a 486 computer with no hard drive. Uh, that That's unfortunate, but... Oh, the well. story is better than I, I thought. I was like, that was a cool story, Jamie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure what yeah. it has to do with the App Store, but... Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there was no approval process there. Uh, I had this one game called Attack, uh, which you would... Like, me and my brother and my cousin and my other cousin, we would all be on the same keyboard, okay? It was a very simple game. You have left, right, and shoot. And you would be driving these, like, tanks around the screen. Left and right would turn the, the tank and the middle button would shoot. And you're just trying to shoot each other, right? It's just like a little tank war happening. And uh, the problem was, though, in those old days, the keyboard would lock up if you had too many keys pressed at the same time. And everybody would have to let go. But everybody's like hammering the keyboard, right? Trying to shoot. So we would yell, keys, keys. And everybody would have to take their hands off the keyboards and then go back and like keep, start start playing again. 
It's like it's like at yeah. the hospital when they do the defibrillator. <laughs> Clear. Clear. <laughs> Clear. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I've got so many stories. Anyway, anyway, uh, we can move along. That's not how we do things these these days. Very often, anyway. <laughs> so let's talk about how we do app store releases now in modern times. Yeah, how do we do that? Uh, I, I'm I'm not the person to ask normally because it's been a while since I've been a part of that process. So it usually, at least at Infinite Red, and I think for a lot of React Native projects, it starts with Fastlane, uh, which is a tool that automates the build process and the uploading of your app binary to the App Store or the Play Store. And is this a React Native specific thing or is it a like native tool as well? I think you can use Fastlane outside of React Native if you're doing like iOS and Android builds. And if you haven't checked out Fastlane, please do because it saves tons and tons of hours, you know, just trying to deal with all that build setup. I'm going to their homepage, fastlane.tools. Great domain, by the way. And it actually puts front and center, developer hours saved, 26 million. Wow. <laughs> it actually tells you every time you run it, it tells you how much time oh, you saved. Okay. <laughs> Each time it saves an hour. Mm -hmm. Is that what it is? Yeah. Yeah, we've been using Fastlane for, I guess, three or four years now and... It's really good. What does it do to save us to save you an hour? So like if you're a mobile app developer, there's a ton of, you know, processes you have to follow to like release iOS and Android applications. And the primary goal of Fastlane is to just automate that. And when you have Fastlane set up, pretty much any developer on your team can have it set up and release it. So the idea is you don't have this one person who's doing the release instead you, any developer could do it. And it automates things like capturing screenshots, which um, we need to uh, have for like our apps on iOS and Android stores. It also automates um, things like publishing new releases, automates code signing, and it, it updates the versions and submits that. So it's really helpful in saving all your time and code signing, screenshots, and all of that. When are they going to add automating writing the code of the app, too? Soon. Okay. <laughs> and then we lose all our jobs. <laughs> that, that, that does sound pretty pretty useful. And we use it in Infinite mm -hmm. Red. I know that. Oh, yeah. Okay. Every every project we use Fastlane. Yeah. It, like Aditi said, it, it takes a bunch of little detailed things that you'd have to do that are pretty much the same on every project. Mm -hmm. And boils them down into a few commands. And you can like look in the Fastlane documentation for the options that you pass to those commands and then just run it. Uh, and it just works. Hashtag just works. One thing we heavily use it for is also beta deployments. So this doesn't just help with prod deployments to the App Store, but you can use it for testing as well. So if you have like 20, 30 testers and each of them can get their own beta version of the app and Fastlane can automate that as well. Yeah, we use it pretty heavily for that as well. And it'll like there's all sorts of different plugins for Fastlane to, to mm -hmm. help with that kind of thing. Like we have one that we use that will put a different banner across your app icon for like alpha releases versus beta and right. it'll put the, the version you can put all sorts of info so that the tester knows exactly what what app they're testing or like what version of the app they're testing little useful things right. like that there's tons of plugins mm -hmm. and we use test flight for uh, ios and we use crashlytics what do you use for beta deployments we use Test Flight for iOS, and we just go through the Play Store for Android betas. Okay. Yeah, for anybody who doesn't know, um, iOS uses an app called Test Flight, uh, which lets you release beta builds to a select group of testers, and they just get it straight to their phone, and they can leave feedback about what they found. You can you can leave notes about what they should be testing. Uh, it's really really slick. Uh, and then on Android. You can you have several options. You can do closed track alpha builds, I think, which are basically you just specify exactly who will get it and then they can download it. And then you can do open track betas, which uh, will upload to the Play Store, but you have to have a certain URL to download it. But it integrates with the Play Store so that if they have the production version of the app, it'll 
automatically switch to the beta version. I think automation is one of those things that when you don't have it, you don't really notice, you know, like how much work you're doing. But once you have sort of tasted the freedom (laughs) of just Mm -hmm. pushing a build and then it does everything for you, that is something that you don't want to go back from. Right. And especially all of these are just manual useless tasks anyway yeah so you don't want to waste your developer's time or anybody's time to do that yep. the cool thing we were talking about test flight is i just saw on their web page it says you can invite up to ten thousand testers mm-hmm. uh, on test flight so that's yeah that's pretty awesome there's all sorts of different scales like huge companies like facebook mm-hmm. or something would probably want a lot more testers testing their beta releases than right some of our client projects where there's like 10 <laughs> yeah we usually have less than 20 30 uh, testers, yeah. That is definitely something where you want to reduce the friction as much, much as possible because often you don't get enough testing. You, you really need more. And so reducing the friction is extremely important. So automating that part of it is really key, I think. So after you're done releasing betas and getting feedback and you're ready to release your production app, Fastlane also makes it pretty easy to do that. It's sort of the same process. You just tell it to do a, a release build instead of a debug build and it'll upload it to the store and you can release it manually from there. And an alternative to something like Fastlane, I think, is App Center. Mm-hmm. It's by Microsoft and even the code push feature got integrated into App Center now. Mm. Um, a lot of people are using App Center these days too. It I think pretty much does the same same thing as Fastlane. I haven't used it, but you could use it for React Native. Native iOS, native Android, and mm-hmm. even Windows apps, apparently. Yeah, they, uh, they've they <laughs> kind of done the, the typical Microsoft thing where they've branded it with something else. So it's Visual Studio App Center. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's, you know, used, everything used to be Windows. It, it might have been Windows, you know, App Center and then Microsoft a- App Center. Anyway, Visual Studio, Microsoft yes. Visual, Visual Studio App Center. Uh, <laughs> yes. That's at appcenter.ms. That is something we have used on a few projects as well. I don't know, Robin, if you've actually been on a project that's been using App Center or not. I have. I have. Okay. Yeah, we've I've done we didn't use it for builds. We mm. used we used Fastlane for the builds, but we used App Center for crash reporting. Okay. So, so you can kind of mix and match them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we use mm-hmm. it for crash reporting, uh, analytics, uh, that type of thing. And I've and we've used Code Push as well, which for those of you who don't know, Code Push is an App Center feature that lets you push over the air updates to your app without having to go through additional app review. And that's just a React Native feature though, mm-hmm. right? Right. It, up- so, it updates the JavaScript bundle. Yeah. So it's it's taking the JavaScript bundle and if the native code hasn't changed, then it can simply download the new file because that's all that the bundle is, is, is a file. I mean, think of it just to put it in terms that our audience will understand. Think of it as loading a cube basic file onto a three and a half inch floppy and bringing it across the water to your cousin's house. That's basically <laughs> what's happening, but it's doing it over the air. To be honest, I've never actually totally understood how that happens with code push. Cause I always thought that the job, JavaScript bundle was inside the app binary file. The thing about that is like the dot IPA and dot APK are really just like zip files. They're not really like a binary file They're I mean, they are binary, but, but it's like, it's binary like a zip file is. So you can bring different files in and out of it. Um, and I'm actually not totally certain how that is like expressed when it's in the actual, like, does it download and then unzip it? Like, I don't know. I guess I should probably look into that. There are people who know in our audience who are currently like shouting at their, <laughs> at their right, radios. What, are, what would they be shouting? They're not shouting at the radio now. What are they shouting at? Shout at their smart speaker. Their smart speaker. <laughs> Headphones. <laughs> They they know what it is and we don't. So apparently like the apps can query for updates yeah. using like the client SDK. So whenever we push your updates yeah, to the cloud, then it can query for it and get it mm-hmm. on the user's device, I believe. Yeah, it may just be that if you have code push integrated into your app, it makes it so that it will gr- know how to grab the bundle from somewhere. I think so. I think that's how that works. Uh, there ha- There is a client, you know, piece of this that manages that that part of Mm -hmm. it if you're using expo it already has it built in you don't even need to manually have code push uh, installed or do anything with it you can automatically update your app expo uses a different mechanism it's it's very similar but they're not using microsoft Mm -hmm. windows azure visual studio app center I, I, I don't know if I got that right. Uh, they're not using that service, but they're using something very similar. And what's really cool about the Expo one is you can use it even without Expo. I didn't know that. Huh. Spoiler alert. Make sure to tune in next week where we 
talk to Brent Batney about upcoming updates to Expo. Absolutely. Nice. Nice job. You should be doing the, the promos. Definitely not. At Infinite Red, we have a an open source repo that we very brilliantly called just open source. We detail in there how we do kind of continuous development. And or I guess it's more like the, the steps to set it up. And we did it for ourselves, to be honest. It's It's not really like... Like we made it open source, but we don't really promote it a lot. It's mainly for our internal team to refer to. And I will link to it in the show notes, but it goes through a lot of these different processes. The very first thing is like write tests. Make sure you have some tests because if everything's automated, you need some sort of a like gatekeeper. I was going to say, with grain of salt, I don't think that thing has been updated in like two years. Uh, let's see. Last commit July of last year. So, uh, you know, it's it's it has okay. something. Okay, not in two it. years, but... <laughs> <laughs> maybe a bit yeah. still yeah so if i mean it is open source obviously so if you notice anything wrong with it submit pull a pull request. request welcome yes please do there there's also an experimental section uh, for github actions right now everything's kind of circle ci which is a ci service that we use pretty extensively at infinite red but it just gives you a good sense for how to set up uh like how to even set up like fast lane and and all of these different uh, tools. We were successful once. It, I think it was the Chain React app. We were successful getting Fastlane beta deployments automated mm-hmm. via Circle CI. It was not easy. Mm-hmm. It's a little bit tricky to to deal with doing things like certificates and whatnot, mm-hmm. and like Xcode yeah. builds on a CI machine. But it is possible, which is really slick. So when you merge a pull request. Your testers will get a beta. Speaking of Fastlane, I think another interesting thing that App Center gives us that Fastlane doesn't is all kinds of analytics. So you mm. can see your audience grow, you can see who's using it, which country they're at, and all of that stuff. So you probably don't need like Google Analytics if you're already using App Center. Yeah, that's a big one. I do know Fastlane has a pretty slick integration with Crashlytics. So if you're using Firebase mm-hmm. Crashlytics for your analytics and crash reporting, you should be able to integrate pretty well with Fastlane. It does seem like there are a lot of different tools. I think that that's one of the reasons that they built App Center was to just kind of centralize all of these different tools in one place. Um, I think I pulled my React Native engineers at Infinite Red a while back and I said, okay, you've, you know, if you've used App Center and if you've used Fastlane, which do you prefer? At that time, almost everybody said Fastlane, I think. There were a mm-hmm. couple who said that they preferred App Center. And of course, that may change over time. But that was kind of the the general thought was, well, Fastlane is just a little bit easier, a little bit less. I think there were some some issues with flakiness with uh, App Center, if I remember correctly. Yeah, that was a while ago. So they may be resolved now. Yeah. So let's talk about the the stores themselves. And like once you've yeah. done your Fastlane, you've got your build uploaded. What's the the actual process like shipping shipping your app. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I used to do this part of the process, I do remember one of the tough things was getting it past Apple's review committee. And, you know, you have to provide a demo account. Uh, So you have to like, you know, give them some way to log in and and try the features of your app. They've gotten even more stringent since then. There are a lot of things that you can't do and that you have to do properly. You have to explain yourself a lot better than you used to. And I actually had a really bad example where I built something this was way back in like the phone gap days when you know cordova when uh when i was i built an app for a client and unfortunately they they just kept telling us well the experience isn't good enough basically it's not it's not a good enough experience we don't want this on the app store and it was very disheartening because it was like there wasn't a lot we could do phone gap just didn't perform to the level we needed it to and we did get it on the the google play store because at that time, they had almost no <laughs> standards. Uh, that has changed as well, quietly. Now they have a review process too. They're not still. They're still not as stringent as Apple. But I do remember that being a big problem that where we would continually get these rejections, and they were often like seven days apart. So you're sitting there like waiting for a week, and then they'd come back with a very vague like, "Hey, you did something wrong. Go fix it." And we're like, uh, "What? You know, what do we do?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Apple the Apple review process is pretty notorious for being one really subjective. You can literally get an app rejected or approved without any changes, like if you get a different reviewer. And we've mm-hmm. had that happen. Right, it's random. We we've yeah. had apps that have been approved for 
many versions in a row and then will get rejected for something that was completely untouched in that update. Mm -hmm. So it just depends on your reviewer. And they're also, they're subjective and they're also very detail oriented. So make sure you re read the the terms or the, yeah. the rules for apps. I'll, we'll make sure to link those in the show notes. But there's a bunch of rules about what your app can and can't do and yeah. can and can't sell. And They have like, I think it's on the developer dot apple dot com. Mm -hmm. yep. There, the reviewers are very good now about pointing to the specific line item that you violated, though. Yeah, that's good. They're getting better. They're listening to feedback, and that's that's really helpful for it's. It can still be pretty. Like we just had a rejection last night. Uh, Brian Stearns, one of our engineers, had a rejection. He had just updated to the latest version of Expo on the particular app that we were that we're using and submitted again, and they came back and said, nope. Uh, you you still have the same problem. Basically, we're using one of the location. We're asking for one of the location permissions that they don't let us ask for anymore. And mm -hmm. it's very. It seems like an automated rejection, and we're not sure where it's coming from. And and Expo SDK forty is supposed to take care of this. So this is the type of thing where it can be very frustrating uh, to us when it doesn't feel like we know really where this is coming from. And we're not using that that SDK. I, I had that same problem happen to me uh, a couple times. It can also be really frustrating because the cycles can take days. So you'll try something and resubmit it and it'll be days later when yeah. you get the next rejection and find out it didn't work. Yeah. And I remember back in the day, we would look at a website called appreviewtimes.com, App Store Review Times. And it would actually aggregate data from Twitter, people would post like app store review time, four days, and then hashtag it. And it would actually aggregate all of that data so that you could get a, a some sort of a sense of like, how, how long is it taking for them to turn things around? And I, I used to go there and be like, Oh, right now it's 14 days. Well, I'll have to tell the client that, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's been 14 days in recent memory. They actually put a notice if you go there now app is it uh, appreviewtimes.com you'll see that they say we don't really do this anymore because they've improved their turnaround it's times. usually 24 to 48 hours yeah i will say pro tip if you have a reason that your app needs to be approved like asap like for example you're putting on the first north american react, react native conference in the united states <laughs> uh, and you need to make a pretty critical update but the conference is starting in a few hours yeah. You can request an expedited review mm -hmm. and they will, if you have uh, a legitimate reason, they will pretty much turn it around right away. And another thing to add on there is if you don't have a ton of changes that really need to go through the app store, you can always utilize the code push feature yeah. and try to push also, your code if you have true. like urgent pushes, which is just in your JavaScript files or, you know, styling and things like that. Very good point, too. Yeah, that's that's a great use for, for code push for sure, is getting those time-sensitive updates out. Let's talk about Google Play. It's always been easier and nicer. We'll almost never discuss, like, things like, oh, how long is this going to take? It's been instant, maybe a day or so, and then it's done. Yeah. I don't think I even noticed when they added the review step. I mean, people were talking about like, oh, you have to get Play Store reviews now. And I was releasing apps and I don't think I ever noticed because it's so fast. Mm -hmm. And I, the Google Play Store also has an automated uh, review step in place, which checks your app for crashes and various ac accessibility things, I think, and will give you a report. It's like kind of typical Google, right? They would prefer to have machines do something if they can instead of humans. <laughs> And Apple, that's a typical Apple thing where they like the human touch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they do. They definitely do. In this case, I think I prefer the machines. Absolutely, because if we're on the end where we're releasing the applications, I prefer Google Play. And you, you don't have to deal with as much like certificates and provisioning profiles and all of that. It's, you make your one key store and mm -hmm. then that's kind of it. You don't have to you don't have to generate certs every time. If you do lose your key store I guess you still need to contact their support team and get a new one, but that's about it. Is that if you have released your app to the store with a particular key store and you lose it or it's compromised? Lose it. Yeah. Yeah. So don't lose your key store. They actually 
usually offer mm-hmm. to manage it for you, which I think is the smartest option most of the time. That's true. So regarding Expo, we we have submitted uh, at least one, maybe two Expo apps to the App Store. The process is fairly similar. Uh, you can build, You first off, you have to build a standalone app because Expo normally hosts like the bundle. You have to, you're using like the Expo app to, to access it and stuff, but you want to build a, a standalone app that was something that is, has its own binary, its own bundle, everything kind of baked in like a normal React Native app would be. So you, you have a way to build the standalone app. And then once you, once you've done that, then they actually provide some, a CLI utility expo upload colon Android expo upload colon iOS. And then that also allows you to, there's some, some, there's different uh, options to, to do this. They, they kind of try to ease that path as much as possible. But at the end of the day, you're still going through the app store review yes. and the play store review. That's exactly right. So that's, uh, that's kind of a big, they, you know, you can do it completely manually. You can use their their helper. From what I've heard, it's it does make it a little easier. Uh, but we're going to be talking to Brent, as Robin said, uh, in a future episode. So let's you know definitely stay tuned. I'm sure that he'll have some things to say about that. So a friend of mine, Jason Sophia, recently released a tool called Jarvis Jarvis Dev Tools, and it's, I, I haven't tried it yet, so I don't, I don't know much about it. I would, I would love to have him on the, the program to talk about what he's doing there, but it is specifically focused on react native and it really is kind of a fast lane app center style alternative. And I think that's really cool that there are react native focused tools coming out for this problem. And so uh, in a future episode, maybe we can have Jason on the on the program and go through what he's doing over there. It's it's still in beta. It's still kind of a, a new thing that he's building, but uh, but it does look really exciting. That would be very cool. When I think Jarvis, I think like a voice assistant. I'm pretty sure that's what that's what Mark Zuckerberg named his personal home automation system. I remember Ask Jeeves. That was a little yes. different though. I the remember pre Google search engine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think I was in sixth grade or something, and people were talking about askjeeves.com. Yes, the little butler. Oh, yeah. Flashbacks. Cool. Anything else? Any other tips or tricks for the App Store, uh, getting through the App Store approval and getting it up on, getting it on people's phones, I guess? I guess their guideline that they have, which is like 100 pages, mm-hmm. just need to go over <laughs> at one time and yeah. use the headings. Make and... sure you read that. Maybe before you start building your app, make sure your business model is mm-hmm. going to pass the guidelines. That's a that's a fantastic <laughs> piece of advice because there are situations, we've had people come to us and say, hey, we'd like to build this app. And we're like, yeah, that sounds great. Apple will never let this through. And mm-hmm. that is very disappointing to them. I have emailed apple before and said hey in concept does this sound like it might get through the process they're usually a little non-committal about it but Mm -hmm. uh, they'll give you kind of a sort of yes or a sort of no um so that is worth doing and i have gotten people on the phone from the app store review committee before so that does happen the one time i was just struggling and struggling and struggling Hmm. and i finally got someone kind of higher up at apple to call me and they gave me some useful advice on how to how to get through. But yeah, uh, that that's definitely something that you want to watch is like I'm I'm not blatantly, you know, <laughs> like my whole business model isn't isn't based on something that that Apple's not going to let through. Especially if you have a lot of in-app purchases mm-hmm. and notifications and stuff, you want to yeah. watch out. Notifications, what location, they design guidelines and all. Notifications, mm-hmm. location and payments are some right. big ones that you want to be yeah. careful about. Yeah, for sure. And and now even things like accessing the mic, that one is a big kind of hot button thing because people people think that apps spy on them, you know, when they're not open. And Apple's very cognizant of that and they don't want people to think that's the case. I noticed on my iPhone 10, I've got a I guess now a little a few years old iPhone 10, but it has a little green light that comes on when the mic's on Mm -hmm. and that's helpful just to know like hey my microphone's on or Mm -hmm. or it's not well hopefully this episode was helpful to people there are a few good tips in there if you have tips or tricks go ahead and tweet it out to our twitter handle 
at React Native RDIO. And uh, the best ones we will retweet. And we'll call that part of it a wrap. Uh, does Do either of you have a weird bug for this week? I have a weird issue going on. Uh, it's not a bug. I'm doing a massive React Native upgrade. So we're going from, I think, somewhere in the late 59, mm. 0.59 to like the latest. Wow. And it's a different world now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was a, that's a big so, jump. The, six, the 59 to 60 was was a big deal. Yeah. So it's uh, I'm just doing like, you know, smaller versions first and then I've re I'm somewhere I'm trying to do 62 now. And that's where we have all kinds of changes. Like the pod file looks like really clean and the Firebase library we were using doesn't even exist anymore. It's gone to a different repository. So just just doing fun stuff. We'll have to do an entire episode about React Native upgrades in that mm -hmm. that fun world. Yeah, we should. Are you using React Native diff purge at all? Um, what's that? I'm using the upgrade helper. Okay, it's probably the same thing. I mm -hmm. think. Uh, I the upgrade helper is very cool. Like you just go in there and tell which version you're on, and then which version you want to go to, and then it tells you all the files you need to change. Um, yeah, that that's actually yeah okay to totally that's that's powered by diff purge. So um. Yeah, you can just choose where I'm going or where I'm coming from and where I'm going. And then are you going version by version or are you just making a big jump? I'm not doing the big jump, but I'm doing like jumping to 62 first and okay. then going into 63 point whatever it is. To oh, okay. For okay. Yeah. Interesting. Not fun. Yeah, that's that's definitely probably its own episode. Mm -hmm. I, I like we that. Could, we, yeah, we could spend a whole episode talking about how to upgrade React Native. Mm-hmm. Cool. Well, thanks a lot to both of you for joining me in this conversation today. As always, thanks to our producer and editor, Todd Wirth, our transcript and release coordinator, Jed Bartoski, and our social media coordinator, Missy Warren. Thanks to our sponsor, Infinite Red. Check them out at infinite.red slash React Native if you're interested in working with Infinite Red as a senior React Native developer in the US or Canada. Go to careers.infinite.red. A special thanks to all of you listening today. We really appreciate you listening to our show here. Make sure to subscribe. Tell a friend if you think that this episode would be helpful to you. It, maybe if someone's going through the App Store process right now, have them listen to this episode and come out the other end, hopefully uh, with a few more tips or tricks. If they're more confused, we take no responsibility. See you all next time. Bye. See ya. See ya.